very happy to be here, and I'll try to do my best today to share with you a little bit about my journey. Uh, I'd like to uh, just acknowledge the TTC students who are coming to the end of your training in just a few days. I know, having sat in your seat for a month, that your knees are tired right now, and <laughs> <laughs> legs are a little bit tired, and then the, your whole body's probably a little bit tired. But uh, I've been in your seat, and I understand what you're going through, and I just have a deep, deep, deep respect for the journey that you're on. You could have gone anywhere for your yoga teacher training. You could have gone to a local studio, and instead you went to a traditional yoga center. And it is not everybody who is called to go to a traditional yoga center. And so I acknowledge you, and I really wanna honor the ashram for creating this space for all of us to come to, to have the tradition of yoga so authentically represented, such a brilliant shakti that has flowed from the early teachers of yoga in India through Swami Shivananda to Swami Vishnu Devananda to Swami Sarupananda, Swami Brahmananda and all of the Swamis and all of the staff that are here who touch our lives, who touch our hearts, who touch our minds. And it's really such a blessing to, to be here and to uh, share that with all of you. And I also wanna acknowledge the, the Yoga Nidra teachers who are completing their training tomorrow. Uh, who have been delving into the subtle energy of the subtle body through their awareness. They have been uh, going into a deep, deep state of conscious relaxation. And from that state, being able to examine their subtle bodies, remove blockages to the flow of energy. And then from that place, enter into the state of awareness known as Yoga Nidra. And from that state of awareness, we are able to become conscious creators and we can create the reality, we can create the experience of life that we want to have. We can overcome the obstacles in our lives that stand in the way from who we are to who we want to be. And so that is what we have been delving into for the last now uh, four full days, and tomorrow will be our fifth day. Today what I wanna do, is, or this evening what I wanna do, in the little bit of time that we have together, is to share with you uh, you know, I was sitting in the chair just, just before coming up here and I realized uh, that what I wanted to share with you tonight is actually the first uh, lecture that I gave here at the ashram 22 years ago, uh, maybe 23 years ago, it was 1997. And uh, I've been coming every year since, many times actually in some years. And this was the first lecture that I gave and it was really sharing about my journey to understand the cause of suffering and why that was important to me and what I found out along the way. And you know, for me in my life, my dharma has been to remove the cause of disease, the cause of suffering. And I've been clear about that dharma since I was, uh, it started to become cognizant when I was about 13 years old. Uh, and then it grew from there until eventually I had the language to really express and understand what I already knew in my heart. So when I was 13 years old, and even before that, my dad would ask me many times, he'd say, Mark, what do you wanna be when you grow up? And before the age of 13, I used to say, well, dad, what I really wanna do is I wanna be a baseball player. I wanna play for the New York Yankees. I grew up in New York, and uh, my hero was Mickey Mantle. He was, the, he was the everything of baseball in New York. And, uh, one of the great baseball players of all time. I remember going to his retirement baseball game when he, he was honored in, in, in Yankee Stadium. He was my hero and I wanted to be just like him. But when I was 13 years old, uh, my dad asked me yet again, he said, Mark, what do you wanna be when you grow up? And for the very first time in my life, I gave him an answer that really wasn't from my head, it was from my heart. I looked them right in the eye and I said, Dad, what I really want to be when I grow up is happy. That's what I want to be. I want to be happy when I grow up. And I didn't even know exactly what that meant. He looked at me and I could just kind of see the wheels turning in his mind. What do you mean? And the reason I said that was because all around me, people were unhappy at that time. All around me, there was suffering. This was a time in, in US history, I guess, when uh, the country had just gone through the Vietnam War. Uh, people were, 
were still in shock from the number of people that had been lost in the Vietnam War. So many of the, the young people on the block that I lived, there were uh, uh, people a little older than me that had gone off to war. Uh, we were listening to the news all the time. My family was listening to the news all the time. It wasn't good news. Um, in my family, there was a lot of, of, um, a lot of complaining, actually, to be honest with you. When I was growing up, uh, I, lived, I lived in a couple of different places, but at one time, my whole family, my cousins and I, uh, my, my parents and my family, my cousin's family, another cousin's family, we all lived on one block. And so they'd visit all the time with each other. And always when they would visit, I would listen to the conversation. I was maybe 10 years old, 11 years old. And they were always complaining about something. Either somebody was sick and they were complaining about that, or it was about the world and they were complaining about that. And, and everybody was also unhealthy. They were coughing, they were smoking, they were drinking. Uh, everybody was unhappy and everybody was unhealthy. And I remember thinking to myself, I don't want to grow up into that. There's got to be more to life than that. There's got to be more to life than than the life that they were portraying, which was going to a job each day that you didn't really like, and then coming back and complaining about it, um, living in a world that there was just so much discontent and being caught up in that drama. I, I just thought, you know, there has to be more to life than that. And so I started to keep my, my eyes open. And when I was 13, and my dad asked me, that's what was going through my head. I said, well, dad, what I really want to be is happy. And what I meant is happy and healthy, because when you're unhealthy, you're unhappy too, or at least uh, they were. And so I kept my eyes open. And when I was 16 years old, I met a man who in many ways became my first teacher, a very unlikely teacher. He wasn't, a, he wasn't your usual spiritual teacher. He wasn't a yogi. Uh, his name was Ernie Landy, Ernie Landy, right? An un unlikely teacher. And, and Ernie was a chiropractor. And uh, uh, any chiropractors here, aside from John's a chiropractor, anybody else a chiropractor? Well, oh, you are, excellent. Well, he had bought the, uh, the practice and had been running the practice that was run by a famous chiropractor, Reggie Gold. And so, I had this connection now to Reggie Gold and, and he's a very famous chiropractor and, and, and Ernie. And I was in the office and I was sitting in the office and there was a picture on the wall and I read that picture and, and it changed my life. It, the, the picture was just words on a wall. That's all it was. And the word said something to the effect of uh, a person slips in the fall on a snowy sidewalk is a small thing. When he falls, he knocks a vertebrae out of place. That's a small thing. That vertebrae out of place, it uh, interferes with the nervous system of that person. That's a big thing to that person. And by interfering with the nervous system, that person gets sick and their health and well-being is diminished. And, and so I, I read that and it continued on and it said, uh, a, a thousand people in a city slip and fall every day and a thousand people's health declines because of that. And in a state, a million people slip and fall every day and that vertebrae moves out of place and it interferes with the, the flow of energy in their body. And in the country, tens of millions of people slip and fall. And in the world, hundreds of millions of people slip and fall. And then it said, and along comes a man and one man is a small thing. And that man sees the vertebrae out of place. And that's a small thing. And that man adjusts the back and puts that vertebrae back into place. And that's a small thing. And by doing that, that restores the flow of energy between that person's brain and body. And that's a big thing to that person. And then multiply that person by a thousand and you step up the health of a community. Multiply that person by a million, you step up the health of a, a city. And by, by, by 10 million, a state and a hundred million, the country, and a billion, the world. And I thought, wow, I want to do that. And the other reason I wanted to do that was because Ernie was happy. Ernie was happy and Ernie was healthy. And maybe he was the first adult that I knew that was really just happy and healthy and excited to go to work every day. And I thought, wow, this is great. And he saw my interest. And so when I was 16 years old, he took me with him to South Carolina from New York 
on a road trip, and we went to Sherman College of Chiropractic. Sherman College of Chiropractic at that time was one of the, I'll call it one of the evangelical schools of chiropractic. It's where all the evangelical chiropractors went, and they weren't just interested in healing neck pain and back pain. What they thought they were doing was changing the world. And I spent a week with all of these amazing chiropractors in the field. And they would talk about, about man the spiritual and man the physical. And they would talk about how disease began when man the physical was separated from man the spiritual. And I just listened. They talked about universal intelligence and they talked about innate intelligence. And that disease occurred when you had the separation between universal intelligence and innate intelligence. And I listened. And they were so passionate about it. And as I said, listen, I was thinking in my heart, I was thinking, hallelujah, this is great. I want to do this. So I came back from that and I decided when I was 16 that I was going to be a chiropractor. And I was going to be one of those missionaries, chiropractic missionaries that was going to go out and I was going to save the world. And so when I graduated from high school, I went to do my undergraduate work at the University of Buffalo in biology. And then from there, I went right into chiropractic school. I knew right away. I knew what I wanted to do. I was focused. I just did it. I went into chiropractic school. And just as I was about to graduate from chiropractic school, I had finished all my requirements early, thank goodness. Just before I was about to graduate from chiropractic school, I woke up one morning and the strangest thing happened. I had pain in my right ankle. And I don't know where that pain came from, but it caused me to hobble through school. It was so bad, I, I walked like this through school that day. That's how bad this was. And I didn't remember tripping the day before or stumbling or anything. And I couldn't imagine what had happened, but obviously I had twisted my ankle or something. And the next day when I woke up, it was gone, completely gone. And it was in my other ankle. And now I was hobbling like this. And I had studied enough medicine to know that when pain like that moves from one joint to another, something more serious is wrong. And I didn't know what that was. So I went to the only doctor, the only real doctor that I knew, the only medical doctor I knew at that time, who was teaching us internal medicine at school. And, and he was teaching us also differential diagnosis. You know, we studied all the, the medicine at, at uh, Palmer College. And so I went to him and I said to him, I said, um, I had pain in my ankle here and now it's there. And I'm really worried about it. What should I do? And I, you know, I'm a young guy. I, I'm, I'm studying. I know a lot, but I don't know a lot. And so I'm looking at him. What should I do? What's going on? And he looks at me and he says to me something really profound for, for all the wrong reasons. He says, he says, well, Mark, he says, uh, statistically, I, I should have known then that that was going in the wrong direction. He says, uh, uh, statistically, Young men of your age have a form of gonorrhea called gonococcal arthritis. He says, all you need is a shot of penicillin and you'll be well. And I thought, gonorrhea? That doesn't sound right. But you're the doctor, okay. So I went to his office and I had a shot of penicillin. And on my way out the door, I had an anaphylactic reaction to the penicillin. I had complete anaphylaxis. I passed out on the steps. My heart stopped. And when I woke up, I was back in the office. They gave me an epinephrine. And I woke up and had a rash from head to toe. And he said, don't worry. You're going to be okay. <laughs> he did. He said, no, you're going to be okay. Just go home. The medicine's still going to work. And don't ever have penicillin again. <laughs> I've never had penicillin since then. And so... Uh, the next day, it went from my ankle to my knee to my other knee to my elbow to my elbow to my wrist to my hands till it started affecting two joints, three joints, four joints, five joints at a time. It didn't help me until I was completely bedridden. So then I had to start getting more tests. And we found out that my liver wasn't working properly. For those with a medical background, my liver enzymes were through the roof. My red blood cell count was, was, was way down. My, my spleen was enlarged. Um, skin started peeling off my hands. I started losing weight rapidly. Started losing a lot of weight very, very fast. Probably about 20 pounds by that point. And by the time I got through it, about 30 pounds. And I became allergic to the sun. 
and I started having other, other bizarre symptoms too. I had scratch marks going across my back like this. And then it would change places in different days, just like my joint pain would. It would go, it would be raw, like I was just scratched. And, and then it would be on my buttocks and then it would be on my thigh. They tested me for, you know, at that point they said, you gotta, you gotta start obviously getting really tested. So, so I went to, they, they sent me to Stanford University, which was nearby to where I was studying in California. I went to Stanford University and they ran every, I studied all the immunologists and rheumatologists. They did every test that they could do on me and they found all kinds of problems in my blood. But they couldn't figure out what was causing disease. They didn't know what was causing my problem. So finally, you should appear before the grand rounds. So I appeared before the grand rounds. Grand rounds were all the doctors who, who were in that department come together in a big room and they start talking about your case. Have you seen this? Have you seen this? Have you seen, what would you do? What would you do? They talk about it. And I'd been through four years of, of quasi-medical school and chiropractic school. And so I knew enough to understand that they had no idea what was going on with me. And they thought, you know, he should be, he should be hospitalized and put on different medicines and basically let's see what happens. And that was when, and I'm telling you the short story, um, that was when I decided that I was going to go follow a different path to get well. Um, the night before the grand rounds, I was crying in bed. I was mourning the loss of the life I thought I was going to live. It, the, the, the pain was so bad at this time that the weight of a bed sheet on my body would cause me to scream in pain. That's how bad the arthritis was. It was arthritis in all the joints of my body. I'd wake up in the morning so stiff. You study morning stiffness in school, but you have no idea. It feels like you've taken a bath towel and dunked it in a, in a, um, a bathtub so it's soaking wet and wrap it around your arms and legs. And that's what it felt like every morning when I woke up. My body was just heavy and boggy. I couldn't move, couldn't move. I was crying. And in that state, I heard a voice. And the voice spoke as clearly as you can hear me right now. Clearly as you can hear me right now. And it's, it said to me, first thing it said is, don't worry, you're going to be okay. And I knew at that moment what it meant was not that I was going to get well, but that I'd be well, I'd be okay, whether I lived or died. That was a profound moment for me. All my fear of death went away in that moment. I knew that I'd be okay whether I lived or whether I died. The ease that that brought into me was amazing. I was like, okay. And, and you know, when you hear a voice like that, when it doesn't come from you, but it, it comes from some place that feels beyond you, it spoke from within, but it, it felt beyond, it just changes your whole perception. It changes your life. And it also went on to say that for you on your journey, all the diplomas in the world on the wall aren't going to matter. You're going to need to go on a journey to heal yourself. And if you can heal yourself, then you'll be able to help others. And so I knew in that moment that I was going to have to walk a journey. And when I was at the grand rounds the next day and they wanted me to go in the hospital, that's when I said no. And that was the last time that I went to see the medical doctors for that condition. And I started a journey to heal myself. And, and I talk a lot about that in, in, in the prelude, which is kind of like a first chapter to, to the book, Healing Your Life. And I tell that whole story, and I tell what happened after that story. I started, I continued my journey, not only to heal myself, but really to, to find out the cause of my own suffering and the cause of the suffering of others so that I would be able to help them. That journey led to a lot of places. It led to the best chiropractors and acupuncturists and homeopaths. I knew a lot of people who knew a lot of people who were the best, and none of that helped me. Now, a lot of you know me from the field of Ayurveda, and you probably think I went to an Ayurvedic doctor and then I got well, but that's not what happened. I didn't even know about Ayurveda then. And so I went to a healer who heals to the laying on of hands, a guy by the name of Greg. And he was a psychic, studied in the Philippines, had a great reputation, kind of famous, lived in, in, in uh, Marin County. Somebody told me about him. I figured, what have, what have I got to lose? 
So I went to see him and he laid his hands on my body and started talking to me for about 15 minutes, kind of telling me jokes actually while he was doing his work. He didn't even seem to be concentrating to be honest with you. Just touching different, his hands were hot though, touching different places of my body and 15 minutes later he says, okay, we're done. And he helped me sit up. And when he sat up, I looked at him and I said, I said, Greg, you're psychic, right? I said, uh, um, yeah. I, I said, so tell me, uh, what's going on and what's going to happen? He, he, he says, now I'm expecting some deep mystical, you know, knowledge, something to really ponder about my life. He says, well, Mark, you're going to go home tonight. Your fever's going to rise from 99 to 105. You're going to have tremendous night sweats and you'll be fine in the morning. And I thought, Wow. Okay. I went home and I put a towel underneath me to catch the volume of sweat that would no doubt come pouring out of my body. Three o'clock in the morning, I woke up and I touched the towel and it was dry. Six o'clock, it was still dry. Called him up at eight o'clock. I said, Greg, nothing happened. He says, well, you know, he explained to me, he said, what he did to me was he gave my immune system a jump start. That's what he told me the day before. He said, sometimes you need a second jump start. I said, I can't move. I can't even get there. It took every last ounce of energy to even get there yesterday. And I have no more money. I was a student. I really had no more money. He says, that's okay. Just sit where you are and I'll do the healing from here. I thought, oh, this is just getting stranger and stranger. <laughs> okay, um, I'll sit. I'd been studying some Native American traditions at that time. And I got into some esoteric meditation. So I thought I could sit and meditate. And... I started feeling heat in the parts of my body he touched the day before. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. Maybe it's all in my head. That night I went to bed and Greg was almost right. My fever rose up to 105. I had tremendous night sweats. It just didn't come down. And for the next two weeks, my fever was between 103 and a half and 105 and a half. And now not only was I physically crippled, I appeared as though I was pretty catatonic as well. And I was delusional. And in that state, I started having mystical experiences. I was laying in bed and I had the experience of witnessing my body, which was no longer solid. It was more like a densely packed field of energy. It was more fluidic than it was solid. And there were blockages to the flow of energy in parts of my body where I had pain and disease in my liver and my spleen. And it was from that experience that I learned how, and I've got to keep it short, that I learned how to begin to work with the energy of my body through what I can best tell you is awareness and intention. And I learned how to open up the channels to the flow of energy in my body that I didn't even understand existed, but now I could witness and experience. And these channels were blocked. And as soon as I opened them up, it was like a rush of life energy. I didn't know the word prana, a life energy moving into my tissues at that time that were sick. And you've all seen a plant that is wilting and doesn't get enough water. And you've seen what happens when it gets water and how it perks back up. And when it perked back up, I knew that the tissues would heal if I could just keep the channels of energy open to them. And through my awareness and my intention over that two-week period of time, I learned how to work with my body and keep those channels open long enough for healing to take place. After two weeks, my fever came down. I was much better. I was still very, very ill. And I lost the ability to be so acutely perceptive of the subtle energy of my body. But just like riding a bicycle, I knew in my cells what that experience was like. After I was well, I met a woman who taught me yoga nidra. Her name was Mary Richards. And she was a yogini and she was a psychologist. And she was a woman who, who understood at that time about the power of creating your own experience of reality. And she took me into the state of consciousness that is yoga nidra. And when she took me into that state of awareness, immediately my ability came back instantly within a minute. Instantly I started becoming perceptive and just like a fuzzy picture, it became clearer and clearer and clearer. And once again, in that state of yoga nidra, I could continue to work with my body. She also taught me that once in that state of yoga nidra, after clearing the blockages to the flow of energy in my body, that I could then begin to access a part of myself 
through which I would be able to create the experience I wanted to have of my body being healthy again. I still wasn't well, I was just better. And so I began to practice yoga nidra. I also began to practice it because one of the lasting effects of the disease was that it affected the part of my brain that affects my body rhythms. And so I no longer slept. When I say I no longer slept, I, I really didn't sleep. I got maybe an hour or two of restless sleep a night. Now imagine that being your reality. I began to rely upon yoga nidra for my rest. And for three hours a day, I would practice yoga nidra. I came to learn later, uh, teachers like uh, uh, Swami Satyananda would say, one hour of yoga nidra is like three hours of sleep. That was my experience. Three hours a day of yoga nidra, sometimes more. Sometimes I'd spend hours in that state at night instead of sleeping and working on myself and visualizing myself being well. That's what led me to yoga nidra. I was um, uh, trying to continue my healing. And, and uh, I went into chiropractic practice. I developed a very successful practice in the Bay Area. Um, I, I began to practice chiropractic, but you have to bring your experiences in with you. So I also began to, uh, to practice um, uh, energy medicine. And so I began to become fascinated with energy medicine, and I began to uh, study with various teachers who heal through the laying on of hands and started to read just about everything I could find. I studied with the person who helped me, uh, Greg Shelkin, but I also studied with teachers like Barbara Brennan and started to uh, learn from people like Dolores Krieger, Brew Joy, um, Stanislav Graf, and other teachers in the field of energy medicine. And so that became a part of what I did. Then I found a mentor who, a chiropractor mentor who also worked with energy medicine, Robert Linford, who began kind of to, to cultivate the abilities that I was learning with everybody. So I began to do that. And I also began to uh, teach my patients yoga nidra. So that was my practice, teaching patients yoga nidra, doing energy medicine and doing chiropractic on them. And that was how I got involved with, uh, with the energy side. But I was still exhausted. I had chronic, suffered from severe chronic fatigue for the next seven years after my illness. And so I had to go continue that journey to heal myself. I also herniated two discs in my lower back after a couple of years of practice. And I was suffering tremendously, both from the chronic fatigue and severe back problems. And I realized that I needed to let go of everything, this enormously successful practice. And I needed to go find the real cause of disease. After all, my life was about wanting to know what causes disease. If you can understand the cause of disease, only then can you really understand what it is that you need to do in order to, to cure disease. Doesn't that make sense? How can you cure disease if you don't understand what is causing it? How can you cure suffering if you don't know what causes suffering? What is the root cause? When I got into chiropractic, I understood, I thought I understood, that the cause of all disease was the subluxation, that vertebrae that moves out of place. But then I had to ask the question, what causes that? Brilliant people in the field of chiropractic did take it deeper. They said trauma, toxins, and auto-suggestion, stress would cause that. That was pretty brilliant. I thought a lot about that, but I didn't know how to bring that into my practice. I just didn't understand what to do with that. I wasn't taught what to do with that in school. So I, I sold my practice. I, I, I let it go. And when I sold my practice, I prayed every day that my path would unfold before me and that I would have the courage to walk it. I prayed every day to God. And I said, God, I said, I'm tired. When I try to direct my life, all I do is crash and burn. All I do is get, you know, I've been suffering with this, this, this disease still that, that, that won't let me go. I'm still chronic fatigue. I still get mild relapses of it. Uh, my back is terrible. Um, I'm done. You drive. You drive. I'm going to be in the back seat. Show me a path. Give me the courage to walk it. And I said this, I will completely surrender. I will completely surrender whether I like it or not. I got to tell you, I did surrender. I, I, I um, you know, that's what's led me to running a school, building a profession. I got to tell you, a lot of times I haven't liked it. But when you surrender, it's not about what you like and what you don't like. 
It's about dharma. It's about living in the divine flow and letting that move you. Letting it flow from above down in the inside out and letting that life force energy move you and you getting out of the way so that you can truly be you know, as Krishna is the instrument, as Krishna t- teaches the instrument just like the flute, so that you can be the instrument and the breath of Krishna playing you. And when you allow that to happen and you surrender, what comes out of the flute is beautiful music, and your life becomes a beautiful song. But you've got to get out of the way, you've got to surrender. Two weeks later, after, pract- after doing this prayer every day, I got a flyer in the mail that told me about a postgraduate program in holistic medicine through New York Chiropractic College, where I could learn Chinese medicine, herbalism, homeopathy, and something I'd never studied before or heard about before, Ayurveda. And so I took this postgraduate program, this postgraduate certification course in holistic medicine, and as soon as I heard about Ayurveda, the strangest thing happened. Everything I'd ever known since I was a child felt like it came back to me. What I intuitively knew to be true. And Ayurveda gave it language. It gave language to that which I already knew in my heart. And I knew I'd be dedicating the rest of my life to Ayurveda. And I knew that there I would find the cause of suffering, the cause of disease. And I still didn't know what it was. Even after that postgraduate course, I didn't. The only thing I knew is that disease was caused by a disturbance of the doshas. But I had to ask myself, what's causing that? But I knew that I would find the answers. So after that course, I was so inspired, I went to seek out a teacher in Ayurvedic medicine. So the teacher that I resonated with, the teacher that, um, that I met, that I was introduced to, was David Frawley, Vamadeva Shastra. And so he became my first guide in Ayurveda. And because I had sold my practice and let everything go, all I did was immerse myself in my Ayurvedic studies full time, all day, every day, just getting immersed in it. I was, I was obsessed by it. And when I had studied pretty much at that time, everything that David had written, you know, and, and he's written so much more since. He, he, he's truly one of the great Vedic scholars walking this earth. And I, I, I say that with um, uh, the deepest respect, the deepest respect. But I, I'd read everything that he had written, um, met with him, spent time with him, spent time with teachers uh, that he had brought to the United States. And he introduced me to Subhash Ranade from Pune, India. And so I began to uh, fly Subhash from Pune to my home. And he would bring me the classical textbooks on Ayurvedic medicine, brought me the Charaka Samhita, Shashrut Samhita, Ashtankaradeyam and Ashtank Samgraha, Sarangadara Samhita, uh, Madhava Nadanam, each of these textbooks. And every time he'd come, he'd bring me these textbooks and I would study them. And I would study them and between his visits, I would study them and I'd write down every question that I had. And then he would come and I would ask him every question I had, record every answer. I would break it down when he was gone. I wanted to understand it all. I began to see patients. Soon I had a, a, an Ayurvedic practice that had a six month waiting list for people to come in and see me. Everybody wanted to, to be well. You know, wherever I go, there's two things that people always want. They want to be optimally healthy. They want to be healthy and they want to be happy. That two things everybody wants. And if you don't have either one of those, you're pretty much willing to give up everything you have in order to be happy, in order to be healthy. And when they find out there's a system of medicine that can help you to heal yourself and to become happy and healthy, they want to participate. And so I was sitting one day with David. He had come to visit. We were um, uh, sitting in my, my office and we we're lamenting the idea that there was no profession for Ayurvedic medicine in the United States. And why is it this amazing science? How could it not? For me, I couldn't understand it. How could there not be a developed profession for it? There were a handful of us at that time. You know, people like, 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 like John, who, who knew about Ayurveda and, and a few teachers who came over through the Maharishi organization and a few teachers who, who uh, uh, Swami Vishnu Devananda brought over into this organization very early to try to, to, to spread seeds of Ayurveda. But there was no profession for Ayurvedic medicine. 
And then one day I was sitting in meditation and in that meditation, two hands came, were, were like this and two hands came together with a lotus flower in between. I don't know if I have that picture up here. I've got a lotus flower with a person laying in it. But there was a, it, it became the logo of the school. After I had this vision, I had a graphic artist draw it with a lotus flower in between. It was truly drifting toward me. It sounds crazy, I know. And it was drifting toward me. And again, that auditory voice was there and it communicated to me in a way that I could hear it. And it shared with me at that time what it was that I was to do, which was to, to serve, to build a profession in, in, in the United States for Ayurvedic medicine. And that meant starting a school. And I knew that my graduates would start the national and the state association. And so I dedicated myself to that. I went into seclusion and I wrote a curriculum, which eventually became the textbooks uh, that, I've write, that I've written for the field of Ayurvedic medicine. So I'm gonna cut that part of the story uh, now. And I wanna share with you in the final you know, moments that I have with you, what is it that I learned from that journey? What did I learn from that journey about the cause of suffering, the cause of disease? Why do we get sick? And when I learned this, I also knew that I was home. I knew that I was home. Well, the first thing that you learn, maybe not the first, but it's one of the first things you learn when you start studying Ayurvedic medicine. You learn that the cause of disease is the misuse of your senses. That kind of makes sense. If you take in that which is harmful to you, you're going to get sick, right? The, the technical word for it in Ayurveda is asart mindriyata sam yoga. Asart mindriyata sam yoga. Comes from the couple of root words, satmya or asatmya, which means basically unwholesome. It's not good for you. The indriyas, indriyata, indriyas, your senses, artha, the desire of your senses, some yoga, the combination of them. Put poetically, it's the unwholesome conjunction of your sense organs with the objects of their affection. That's something to meditate on. The unwholesome conjunction, joining of your sense organs with the objects of their affection, the objects of their desire, artha. So what that means simply is that what you take, if you take in that which is disharmonious for you, you will get sick. Now you're all familiar with this idea. You know that if you take in uh, junk food, you know that if you take in junk food, that you're going to get a stomach ache, right? If you take in junk food, the wrong food, too much food, too little food, it's going to make you sick. You know that it'll give you diabetes, heart disease. You take in uh, unhealthy food, you can get cancer. So many different diseases are because of the way in which we eat. But it's not just your sense of taste that's important. It's what you take in through your eyes, your ears, your nose, and even your skin. You take that all in. And, you can, and it can make you just as sick. Think of people who have witnessed trauma and what that does to them, what they've taken in through their eyes. And how now they don't sleep well. And now they get stomach aches. Now they get headaches. Now they get nervous system diseases because of what they've seen. And what happens to a person who has been verbally abused and what they've heard? It also makes them sick. It's junk food for the ears, junk food for the eyes, junk food for the mouth, junk food for smell. What are you smelling? When I was a kid, I worked in a gas station, smelling gas and diesel, and that's junk food for smell. What are you smelling? Right? What you take in can make you sick. And what about touch? Can what you touch make you sick? Now think about that for a minute. There's all different kinds of touch. What about when you're hit? That's going to make you sick. Not just from the physical injury, but from being violated in that way. It's going to wound you on a deep level, which can happen in an abusive family, but it can also happen you know, in school. At least it used to happen more when I was a kid in school. You know, people would get into fights. That wounds you. It wounds you. 
The good news is that if you take in that which is healthy, it brings healing to your body. So you've learned that you can take in healthy food. You're learning about vegetarian diets and you're, 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 you're following programs like, like the three-season diet that John talks about for learning how to eat. And Ayurveda gives you great coaching on how to eat, what foods are right for your constitution and which ones are not. But that's just one sense organ. You also have to learn to take in that which is healthy through your eyes, through your ears, through your nose, and even through your skin. Aromatherapy, color therapy, and not just colors. Just, just look upon beauty, look upon the ocean, look upon the, the gardens that are here. How do you feel when you walk through a rose garden? It's healing, isn't it? Think about walking through a rose garden. Smell the rose. It's beautiful to look at. Just, your stress just kind of melts away, doesn't it? What that does is it changes your physiology. See, you're either in a physiological state of disease or you're in a physiological state of healing. And there's only two states of physiology. That's it. You can break them down into all different parts of disease, but you're either in a diseased state of physiology or a health or a healing state of physiology. You go into a diseased state of physiology when you take in that which is disharmonious for you through any of your five senses, and you go into a healing state of physiology when you take in that which is harmonious for you. Okay? So in my book, Healing Your Life, there's a chapter on every sense organ so that you can begin to learn your constitution, learn the nature of the imbalance, and then learn what to take in through all your senses. And what do you, you know, what about your sense of touch? Well, we can take in oils through our skin and, and touch and massage. And one of the most healing things you can do, you know, the exact opposite of being hit is being hugged. That's one of the most loving, healing things you can do through your senses. So the cause of disease is asat mandriyarta sam yoga, misusing your senses. But I still had to ask the question, why do we misuse our senses? Why do we do that? Even when we seem to know that it's disharmonious for us, in class today, we were laughing about chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> you know, having a chocolate chip cookie, right? It tastes great. I love chocolate chip cookies. I didn't tell the classes. It's one of my two weaknesses growing up was chocolate chip cookies and, and chocolate chip ice cream. Those were my two weaknesses growing up. My parents would go out, and when they would go out, they would bring me either a box of cookies for the night, and I'd eat the whole box, or a pint of ice cream, and I'd have the whole pint. And that was my treat for the night while they went out. And so I, I just love those two things. And even still today, I have to struggle with my, my control over that. Okay? So I, um, I asked the question, why do, we, why do we still take those things in if we know they're not so good for us? So Ayurveda utilizes a term called pragya aprada, which means the failure of the intellect. The intellect fails you. So think about that for a minute. How many of you know that you would feel better in the morning if you went to bed earlier and got a good night's sleep, but still stay up late at night sometimes? And I don't mean when you're here, but I mean when you're home. <laughs> right? You know that. You know you stay up too late, and you know you'd feel better in the morning if you went to bed earlier, and yet you do it anyway. Right? How many of you know that you'd feel better, they would be healthier if you didn't, if, if, if you had organic food rather than food that was sprinkled with pesticides on it. And yet still, sometimes you buy or eat the food that has pesticides on it. You know, but, but you still do it. You still do it. This is what's meant by the failure of the intellect. So it's not just enough to know what to do. Somehow we're going to have to treat the intellect. So we have to treat the intellect in order to help the intellect be able to make the proper decision. If we don't do that, we'll make the decision that is to have the chocolate chip cookie and the, and the chocolate chip ice cream. You see, your intellect has two very close friends, 
two very close friends, giving it advice all the time about what to do. One friend is your ego, and with your ego comes its close family, your senses, right, and your desires. And your ego, your senses, and your desires, they're all closely related to each other. And they're telling your ego, make the choice that's going to bring the most pleasure. Make the choice that's going to bring the most pleasure right now. And avoid suffering. Because that's really all your ego's interested in. Your ego's interested in the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of suffering. Two very important things to keep you alive. And that's, what your, that's the job of your ego basically. So your senses say, eat the ice cream, right? Eat the ice cream. It's going to make you feel good. It's going to bring you pleasure. Have cookie, have another cookie, have another cookie because it's going to make you feel good, right? And there are so many things in life that does that. Now, the other friend is your soul, your soul's voice. Your soul your higher self is saying to you, go to bed earlier. It's telling you to go to bed earlier. It's telling you to eat your vegetables. It's telling you you don't need the ice cream and the cookies. It's telling you all the things that are going to be harmonious for you. Who do you listen to more often? Your senses or your soul? You listen to your senses, don't you? You do. We make choices all the time based on our senses because really the senses are throwing a party for us all the time. Every day is like New Year's Eve. You know, there's, there's, there's fun things to do. There's music and staying out late and great foods to have. And there's so many pleasures to enjoy in the world. And the senses are always telling us to go ahead and tell the intellect, go make that choice. And the soul is there but you can't even hear it. The senses are so loud. The soul speaks in whispers. Go to bed early. Eat your vegetables. Get up and meditate. And most people don't even hear it. And so they live their life according to their senses. So Ayurveda and yoga meet here. And here, Ayurveda and yoga say that if you're going to be healthy, it's not just enough to know what to do, but you're going to have to have a method of learning how to listen to your soul's voice. Because when you hear your soul's voice, everything will change. It will empower you to become the master of your senses instead of the slave. Most of us are the slave of our senses. The senses are telling us what to do and we just go along and do it. And so this is a journey of empowerment. It's a journey of learning how to take control over your life. Ayurveda and yoga are paths of empowerment in your life. But empowerment comes from not your ego. It comes from the soul being able to communicate to your senses. So the intellect fails us. But I still had to ask the question, why? Why does that keep happening to us? And so Ayurveda says that the cause of our intellect failing is something called parinama. Parinama is, means transformation. It means the transformation that occurs within us when we get caught up in time and motion. So think about it. When the mind starts to move, it moves into the future or moves back into the past. And in doing so, we create time. Time does not exist except in the mind. When the mind begins to move, time comes into reality for us. But time is itself an illusion. We create the future in our mind and we remember the past, but there really is only here and now. And in the here and now, there is no such thing as time. But we get caught up in it. The mind starts to move. We get caught up in it. And when we get caught up in it and the mind starts to move, we get caught up in drama, samsara, worldly experience, worldly drama, samsara, worldly drama. We're all caught up in drama, aren't we? 
We're caught up in the dramas of politics. We're caught up in the dramas of love. We're caught up in the dramas of money. We're caught up in the dramas of career. We're caught up in the drama of dharma. What am, what am I supposed to do with my life? There's so much drama to be caught up in. When we get caught up in drama, then the mind becomes so noisy and clouded that we can no longer hear the soul's voice. So the intellect fails us and follows the direction of our senses. And then we misuse our senses. And before you know it, you're having ice cream and cookies. And that's dinner. Because, you're mis- because you, have, you have misused your senses. So if we're going to heal, we're going to have to learn to control our senses, learn to make healthy choices. We're also going to have to learn how to quiet the mind so that we can hear the wisdom of the soul so that it can empower us. And to do that, we're going to have to avoid getting caught up in drama. That's a tough one. To avoid getting caught up in drama. It's everywhere. Everywhere. So these are the three primordial, these are the three principal causes of disease that Ayurveda teaches. But then Ayurveda and yoga say, yeah, but there's one more cause greater than all three of them. And it's the primordial cause of all suffering. And the primordial cause of all suffering is forgetting. Forgetting your true nature as spirit. This is avidya. Ignorance of our true self. Forgetting our true nature as spirit. So when you forget your true nature as spirit, which is what happens when you get incarnated, you immediately get caught up in the drama of the world. Which means the mind starts to move. Time begins to be created for you. The intellect starts to fail and you misuse your senses. And we overeat, undereat, or take in things that are not so good for us. And then when we do that, we disturb the doshas of the body. Only then do the doshas become disturbed. You take in through your five senses that which is disharmonious for you. And now you get your vata imbalance, your pitta imbalance, or your kapha imbalance. And I'm not talking about constitution right now. I'm just talking about what we call vikruti in Ayurveda, which means the disturbed state of the doshas in you right now. What's present in you now, and it doesn't matter what your constitution is, you can have a disturbance in any of the doshas depending upon how you've been living your life. So, If we're going to remove the cause of suffering, there really is only one way. And that is to learn the practices that are going to help you to remember your true nature as spirit. And this is yoga. And this is yoga. And this is the four paths of yoga. And each of the paths of yoga play its part in helping you to remember And as you remember, you start gaining more and more capability to be the the master of your life rather than the servant. And, you know, I say the master of your life with, with, with amusement and, you know, truly because, you know, we are, we are divine beings and the master of our life is our soul power not our ego. The ego would like to think it's the master, but it's not. It's the soul's power that is necessary to control the senses. In, in the Bhagavad Gita, in the uh, Karma Yoga chapter, Arjuna and Krishna are having a, 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 a conversation. And Arjuna says, says to Krishna, he says, he says, Why is it that people do evil things even when they know that those things are evil? 
And Krishna says, and you can translate this in different ways. Sometimes it's translated as, as lust. But he says, he says, because people have intense lust. But the other, the other translation is intense desire, which is what causes you to lust over things. That intense desire is what causes us to, to do that which is disharmonious. And then Krishna goes on to say that if you want to, to overcome this tendency within you for these vasanas, these desires that are within you that establish your tendencies, your samskaras, that you have to cultivate spiritual discrimination. That spiritual discrimination to know what is real and what is not real, what is true and what is not true. That you have to learn to listen essentially to your soul's voice. And when you do that, only then will you be able to control your life. You know, Krishna is in a chariot, right? And the horses are pulling the chariot. And the horses are like your senses, pulling you along. And either they can, can pull you where they want to go, or you're going to need to learn how to guide them. You can imagine Arjuna in there, in his ego trying, but Krishna is next to him, and he's giving him the guidance how to guide them. And where will they take you? If you let them, if you, if you guide them, if you are able to control your senses, they'll take you home. And where is home? To oneness, to wholeness, to union with the divine. And through that journey, you will be healthy. As healthy as you can be. And we use the term in Ayurveda for perfect health. We say swasta. Swasta. Swa, self, sta to be established in the self. Isn't that interesting that that's the word for perfect health? Swasta, to be established in yourself. It means to know yourself. It means to know your true nature as spirit. When you know your true nature as spirit, then you will be healthy. We see this in so many different places in Ayurveda and in yoga. And along that journey, toward perfect health, which parallels the path to enlightenment. And here's why we see that Ayurveda and yoga are sister sciences. But as we move along on that path, our experience of the world changes. It moves from one that is caught up in drama to one of ever-expanding love. And as love expands... You begin to see the divine in all of creation. And your soul self recognizes yourself in everything that you see. Because you are there. You are there in everything that you see. You are there in those things that you see and judge as bad. And you are there in those things that you see and judge as good. And you are there. Because within that which you see as good and that which you see as bad is the same divine essence. The same essence that is in yourself. And with that grows respect for that which is different than you. Grows respect for that which is seemingly bad in the world. But there's respect and there is love and that love becomes unconditional. And the love grows. It grows from I love myself, to I love my family, to I love my community, to I love my country, to I love the planet, to I love all of creation and the universe. And your love grows and grows and grows and grows. And love is your true self. Love is your true nature. The drama is just what gets in the way of the love. It's what gets in the way of the divinity. And the divinity is love and love is the divinity. And when you get out of the way, the love moves from conditional to unconditional. 
It moves from ordinary love to divine love. And what we strive toward, for those of you that, is ho- that are householders, what we strive toward is to be able to bring unconditional love to the world through our relationships with the world. And for those who are monks, what we strive toward is unconditional love that is going to be one with all of creation. And in that way too, inspiring the love out in the world. And that is the journey. That's the journey. It's not easy. It's not easy. It's the most difficult journey there is. It's uphill in both directions. Because you're working against your ego. You're working against your karma. You're working against your desires. And that's why renunciation is an important part of your journey. Because only when you renounce what your senses desire can you be free from that desire. Krishna says to Arjuna that your desire is like a fire. Constantly having to consume more. A fire to stay alive must consume. If you don't feed the fire, the fire goes out. So you got to have more and more and more. Until you eventually renounce. You've got to renounce those desires. And for those of you, when you're ready, when it's right for you on your journey, you may renounce the world, the worldly experience, and become like the monks who are here, who are examples of selfless service. No longer tied to the bonds of the world in seeking to just be the embodiment of love. And we take it step by step by step. And no matter where you are in that journey, I want to leave you with this. I believe that you will grow faster by loving your ego than by hating it. I tell my students that we need to love ourselves to death. We have to learn to love ourselves where we are now. That's the first step, no matter where you are. Whether you're a drug addict or whether you are living high on the mountaintop, we must learn to love ourselves right now. Only then can our love expand outward to another person, to family, to community, to the world. And only then will we be ready to renounce. And then we renounce even that, all that love. And then we become the essence of all of creation. So as you go forward on your journey, wherever you are today, Go to bed tonight and love yourself for where you are. And remember, your true nature is spirit. And let that empower your intellect and your senses. And when you leave here and you go back out into the world, be a force for harmony. Be a force for love in whatever way you serve. Om Namah Shivaya.